Well, good morning and happy Easter. If we can stand and worship together, we'll praise our risen Savior. In all the earth and break of dawn, the Son of heaven rose again. Oh, trample death, where is your
way to start our service, huh? But that's our hope and our trust. Death was arrested on the third day. Jesus rose. I pray that you believe that to be true. If you believe in God's holy word, then you do. All of us on this stage believe that on this day, so many years ago, when we recognize Easter Sunday that Christ walked out of that grave. That's our hope. So we looked at God's word. In Luke 24, this is the resurrection account. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went, and they went inside, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the man said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was uh, still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. We understand that Good Friday had to happen, but praise God that Sunday came, that the third day he rose out of that grave. And so we sing hallelujah, that death was arrested praise our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the true and living God who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is King Jesus. This is who we worship. Let's continue to sing.
In the darkness we 
Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this Easter morning that we celebrate our risen Savior. God, that you are alive in heaven and we worship you this morning, Father. May we not forget, God, this Easter we celebrate our living Savior, God. But every day we get that joy and that promise and we thank you, God, for who you are, for the love and mercy and grace that you have for us, that you show us each and every day, God, and for the promise of a future, Lord. We love you and praise you and worship you, and it's in your holy name we pray. Amen. I love it when a plan comes together. <laughs> you know, as I was reflecting back on this day, you know, we, man, that, that intro video that we just saw, you reflect back on the resurrection, and we're thinking, man, he is. He is our hope. He is our freedom. He is, right? But I was thinking about, can you imagine the ladies that walked to the tomb that day? Can you imagine how crushed they were? All that they had hoped for, they were going to see Jesus in the grave. Can you imagine what that walk started out like of just a very slow walk? with tears, with not knowing what was going to happen, with fear. And then as they get a little closer, one of them looks up and they see the stone has moved. They look at the other one and see the stone. Can you imagine what all of a sudden you go from fear and, and pain and disillusionment to now it's, it's like, What's going on? And all of a sudden, that slow, painful walk turns into a hurried walk and then a run. And then you get to the tomb where the stone has been rolled away and you walk in and nobody's there. Can you imagine the whole range of emotion that they went through? From hopelessness to hope, from defeat to victory. It's that victory that we celebrate today. Amen? Man, that's some good stuff right there. It's, listen, but that's what we hope in. Now, hope is, is an interesting word because there were a lot of us that have plans for today. How many of y'all have plans for later today? All right, a lot, of fam a lot of people have family coming over, and earlier in the week you were hoping it wouldn't rain, right? Now, as some of you are sitting here, you're hoping that everybody that was supposed to bring something is going to bring it, right? There are some of you that are sitting here and saying, I hope he doesn't preach long. <laughs> but you know, in the world that we live in today, there's a lot of hoping that's going on. Some of us are hoping that we get that promotion or hoping that one day we can own our own business or hoping that our retirement will be there with all of the stuff that's going on in the world. Some are saying, one day, I hope my marriage is strong. Now, hope can mean a lot of different things. When the Bible talks about hope in Christ, it's not talking about wishing. It's not saying there's a one in a million sh shot and you're thinking, so there is a chance. <laughs> No, this hope is confidence. This hope is expectation of what is going to happen. It's based on something that we know for certain is there. So the confidence that we have is just not this baseless confidence. It's just not this wishful thinking. Our confidence has an object, and that object is Jesus Christ. Our confidence is in him. So as we go to the Word, we're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And, you know, we can have, there's a lot of things that we think we can have confidence in, but sometimes it just doesn't happen. Uh, I have confidence that my mic is going to work. And sometimes there's no rhyme nor reason, it just doesn't work. Um, life is like that, isn't it? you really begin to understand what you can have hope and confidence in and the things that you can't. Our confidence in Christ can be unshakable. 
not because that we have strong hope, strong confidence, but it's because of who he is. So let's look, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. If you have your Bibles, open them up. Uh, if you do not, the, it will be on the screen. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 1 through 9. Peter uh, starts out by identifying himself, and he says, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, he, Peter, at this point, is at l the very least uh, the most prominent spokesperson for the Twelve. At the very most, he is the recognized leader of the Twelve. Uh, it was Peter, uh, along with James and John, that was the three out of the twelve that Jesus spent most of his time with. And then out of the three, Jesus spent a lot of time investing in, in Peter. And Peter would uh, begin to uh, lead a lot. So Peter identifies himself as an apostle or a messenger of Christ. He then identifies who the letter is to. He says, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, uh, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Now, when you see the words elect in the foreknowledge of God the Father, you understand that none of the persecution that was going on in these people's time took God by surprise. He understood it. He's writing the, this area, the, all of the places that were mentioned are in modern-day Turkey, okay? Uh, so what he's saying to them is, look, you're in God's hand. You, you're not, your lives are not subjects to the whims of people, uh, of, of different uh, people and their agendas. Your life is in the hands of God. So he goes on. He says, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for the sprinkling with his blood. Now, one of the things that you see there just in that short thing, you see the foreknowledge of God the Father, the sanctification of the Spirit, and the obedience to Jesus Christ. You see the Trinity at work in our salvation. Uh, we were just singing about that a minute ago. Now, I know some people, sometimes you hear, well, the, the, you don't see the Trinity, you don't see the word Trinity in the Bible. You might not see the word, but you see the three. Amen? And you see the role that each, each person of the Trinity had in our salvation. He goes on, he says, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now, in a few minutes, we're going to go on to see why we can have grace and peace in our lives. No matter how much turmoil there is in our life, my peace and the grace that I know that I can experience is not based on what happens around me. My grace and peace has, has its source in Jesus Christ. And that's very important for you to understand because if your peace is based on what happens to you, you will be on a roller coaster for your entire life. Amen? See, our peace is based in a person, not in our circumstances. So let's go back. We're going to go back. I'm going to read verses 3 through 5, but we're going to come back to that in a minute. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Now, he, he talks about that. We're going to go back to those three verses in a second. He transitions now. Um, in verse 6, he says, in this you rejoice, in what he's referring back to our verses 3 through 5. And then he goes straight to trials. He goes straight to adversity. He says, though now for a little while, meaning compared to eternity, the trials that we suffer in this life are going to be very brief. He says, for now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. So the various trials, the trials that you and I face are going to come at us very differently. Um, it can be straight up persecution. It can be difficulty in life. It can be because you're facing adversity because of the sinfulness in the world in which we live. There are many kinds of trials that we go through, whether it be our health, whether it be relationships, uh, or whether it be just the basic sustenance for life. But he says, these things will happen for a little while, 
They will be of various kinds, but they have purpose. He says, so that, um, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, uh, that perishes, though it is tested by fire. Now, it just, prove, it just shows us that suffering proves that our faith is real. Now, think about something for a minute. How many of us love to go through difficult times? None of us do. But when you think about the most difficult times in your life, as you came out on the other side of those trials in victory, when you reflect back on those trials, what does it tell you? It tells you that there was a strength that was there that you didn't realize that you had. It gives you confidence now that you overcame this adversity, that now you have increased confidence in the adversity that you'll face in the future, right? The genuineness of our faith that says, as we encounter trials, one of the things, I'll just speak from my own life. As I encountered trials after I came to know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, your first emotion is, God, why me? Why I can't believe this is happening? And you begin to question. But then as you begin to experience and you begin to learn not to trust in yourself, but you begin to trust in Christ to have victory over these things, it teaches you what source to draw from to have victory over the trials in your life. And that's what he's talking about right here when he says, so that the tested genuineness of your faith Every time we go through a trial and we see victory, every time we go through a trial and we see our faith strengthened, it causes us to be able to learn to have more confidence in Jesus Christ. So he, he goes on and he says, um, he says, so that uh, the tested genuineness of, of your faith, more precious than gold, perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our suffering is going to result in praise. And as it does, we give glory and honor to Jesus. I know that many times in our lives, we have the difficulty that happens. But you know, I was just talking to somebody earlier um, about a loved one that had passed. I was glad for both of my parents who had to deal with cancer that I was able to get, when I got to the point to where we understood that this cancer was terminal, that my prayers changed from God, please heal them to God, please go ahead and take them. Why? Because of where my confidence is. My confidence is in where they're going. They're going to be in the presence of Christ. Amen? And you see, why do you want them to stay here and suffer when you know that where they're going is going to be much better than where they are? And it increases your faith because what it does, it puts things in perspective. The trials that hit you early on in your walk, after you've been through a few, they don't shake you anymore. You are able to have an increased confidence in Christ as you go through each and every trial. So he goes on after speaking about the trials and adversity. He goes to verse 8. And he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your soul. Now, as I thought about this, who wrote this, who, who God used to write this letter? It's Peter, okay? Now, when you read about Peter, you read about a guy that experienced the highest of highs in his walk with the Lord and the lowest of lows. Now, I know for me, when I first got saved, I would read stuff that Peter did, and I'm like, oh my gosh, how could somebody do that? And then as I started walking in my faith, and I did dumb stuff, I was like, eh. So I, I, now I relate more to Peter than I did in kind of making fun of him. But, you know, Peter, he, he made such huge claims. He said to Jesus, when Jesus said, you will all abandon me, Peter looks at him and he said, though all of these might, I'm your guy. What do we see next? 
he denies Christ three times to a little girl. We see the ups and downs in Peter's life. We see Peter restored by Jesus. We see Peter's faith go from one that could be broken by a little girl to one that no one could break. What was the difference? It was the resurrected Christ. What makes the difference in our faith? We're not just wishing and hoping. Our faith is in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. Now, as we look at this, and I look at Peter's words when he says, Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him. You know, I thought, as I started the message out on the ladies and their walk to the tomb, we can see how their faith was strengthened. But when I think about us, you know, we we haven't seen Jesus. We, We weren't on that walk. We, we've never laid eyes on him. So what happens? By faith, we look back to what happened on that cross. By faith, we look back to the stone that was rolled away. We look back to the tomb that was empty. All right? But there was an account in John chapter 20 with Thomas. Y'all, I don't, I'll describe it. I'm not going to read the passage. It's in John chapter 20. Verses 24 through 29. You can write that down to to read it later. But what had happened was all the apostles except except Thomas had seen Jesus. Well, they're all talking about it, and Thomas comes in. And they're like, Thomas, you're not going to believe it. We saw Jesus. He's resurrected. And they're all excited. Thomas is like, okay, you're obviously delusional. Some of you have probably been drinking. I'll believe it when I can stick my finger in the holes in his hands where the nails were. I'll believe it when I can put my hand on his side where the spear was gouged in. He said, when I can do that, then I'll believe. Well, about eight days go by. All of the apostles are there. Thomas is with them. And then all of a sudden, Jesus appears and says, peace be with you. Now, See, when I read the Bible, I like to kind of read it with my imagination. How would you have liked to have seen the look on Thomas's face? It goes from that to Jesus walking over to Thomas. Thomas, here's my hand. Put your finger in the wound. Thomas, here's my side. Lay your hand on my side. Thomas's response was one that was very simple, very brief. My Lord and my God. And Jesus' words were very interesting because he shifted from this that was happening with Thomas to us. He says, he looks at Thomas on his knees, confessing, my Lord and my God. And he says... Thomas, blessed are you because you see and believe. But blessed will those be who don't see yet believe. That's us. He was speaking about us that, can't, that never have physically laid eyes on Jesus, but by faith we believe that he died on a cross for our sins. We believe that he was buried in a tomb. We believe that the stone was rolled away. We believe that Jesus was raised from the dead three days later, and through that resurrection, he has caused us to be born again. That's that's our faith. See, blessed are those who didn't see, yet have believed. Now, We're going to go back to verses 3 through 5, and I want to leave you three things to take away from this message this morning. Okay? In his mercy, God's given us these three things that we can put our hope in, we can put our trust in, that we can rest assured that no matter what happens in this world, no matter who invades what country, No matter how much inflation is, no matter who the president of this country is, no matter what political power, 
political party is in power, our hope can rest in these and never be shaken. Verse 3, we know that we have a living hope. We have a living hope. These are in your bulletin. It says, blessed be God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again. He has caused us to be born again. That, it, it, this isn't simply a belief that rests in the mind. It isn't something that just is a result of our intellectual assent to some facts. Okay, You can believe that Jesus died on a cross. You can believe that he was buried. And you can believe that he rose from the dead and still not be saved. Do you think Satan knows those three things? Yes, he does. What's the difference? He's never been born again. Isn't that the whole thing in John chapter 3? Nicodemus, the Pharisee, he knew the Bible better than anybody in this room. But he didn't understand it. And Jesus said, unless you are born again, you will never see the kingdom of heaven. What do you mean to be born again? It means that there is such a change in the inside, in your heart. You go, the whole thing is captured in the U-turn. When you are living life for yourself, you have gone about living life for you. You've abandoned God's plan and purpose for your life, and you're living based on what makes you happy. When you are confronted with the Word, with who Jesus is and what He's done for you, you turn from living life for yourself, and you turn to Jesus. That is called justification. It's when what Jesus did on the cross is applied to your life. I'm no longer the sinful, self-centered person that was seeking his own happiness. Now I've turned to Jesus, trusting in what he did on that cross, and abandoned my former way of life, trusting in him. That's justification. That's when your life has changed from the inside out. That is being born again. So it says that God has caused us to be born again through a living hope. You, you can't go to Jesus' grave. This isn't some religious figure that did some good things and had some cool messages, but now he's dead. He couldn't help himself. We serve a living Savior. Amen? Now, I want to tell you something. That should change everything about our lives. We're not serving some dead guy. We're not serving somebody that could not even help himself. We live in a time where people make all kinds of promises and don't deliver. Jesus delivered. Jesus delivered. Many of you have testimonies where you can testify about what Jesus did in your life, what he is going to do, and where your hope is for the future. So we have a living hope. We also have an inheritance. Have, we have an inheritance, verse 4. He says, to an inheritance, and he describes it like this. An inheritance that is imperishable. Imperishable. It's not going away. It is undefiled. It is unfading. It is kept in heaven for you. Okay, now, wouldn't you like to have an investment that was imperishable, that would never fade away? Okay. Andy, you deal with stocks all the time. Can you promise me that you got an investment for me that will never perish, that will never diminish? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You, you can't promise those things this side of heaven. Our salvation is that inheritance. It is imperishable. It is unfading. We will never be less saved tomorrow than we are today. It is reserved in heaven for you. For all of those who have been born again, for those who have trusted Jesus, we have a living hope in him. We have an inheritance. And then in verse 5, it talks about the fact that we have salvation. It says, To an inheritance is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power 
are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Our salvation is being guarded. There are people who can cause difficulty in my life. There will be adversity that I have to face. There might be, there, I might lose money. I might lose my property. I might lose a lot of things, but one thing I will never lose, and that is my salvation. Because it is being guarded by God the Father. My hope rests in Him. See, the salvation that we have, the inheritance that we have, it's not based on what I've done. It's based on who I know. So, when I repented of my sins and trusted on what Jesus did in the cross, He secured for me something that I could not secure for myself. A living hope. An inheritance. My salvation. Philippians 1.6 says that He who began a good work in you, He who began this work when He changed your life, when this U-turn happened in your life, when you turned from living for self and started living for God, he who began this good work in you, who caused you to be born again, will continue that work until the day of Christ Jesus. So the walk that you have, when I came to know Christ at the age of 24, there was still, <laughs> I didn't grow up going to church, hadn't read scripture, so there was a whole lot of learning that had to happen in my life. A whole lot of change. A whole lot of priorities that I thought things were important. That as I started getting into the Word and Jesus started changing my life, I all of a sudden realized those things weren't important. So on this walk, he who began a good work now will finish it until the day of Christ Jesus. Meaning, God is going to be at work in my life, in your life, through my life and through your life until the day that Jesus comes back again. We can celebrate the fact that he rose, but you know what? We look back on that. But you know what we're looking forward to? Is the day he comes again that makes all things right. That makes all things right. We have a living hope. We have an inheritance. And we have a salvation that is based in fact. In fact, in the last thing in your bulletin, Jesus is the object of our faith and the hope of our blessing. We, we don't, you know, sometimes when you talk to people, well, all I got is my faith. Well, faith in what? Faith that is not grounded in Jesus Christ is not biblical faith. What, what are you going to have faith in I mean, there's a lot of things that people have had faith in that's let them down, right? I mean, I would say that most, if not all of you, came and sat down in these chairs having faith that you wouldn't fall through it, right? How many have ever sat in a chair and fell through it? All of a sudden, you get a little nervous every time you sit down after you do that. Some of you have faith that when you go out, your vehicle is going to start until it doesn't. Many of you have faith that you are investing in your retirement right now. There have been people in this country throughout its history who did that and lost everything they had. There are no sure things this side of heaven. The certainty that we have is in the person of Jesus Christ, who is our living hope, who has our inheritance that is guarded by God. This morning, I'm so thankful that you guys are here this morning. I'm so thankful that many of you will have family gathering. But a couple things. Number one, don't lose sight of what this day is really about. If all, if all this is about is about some rabbit that we're looking for its eggs, which there's all kinds of issues there, but anyway. We've lost sight of what is truly important in life. As you 
sit here this morning. Everybody in here has experienced some type of adversity in their life. Everybody in here has been let down by someone or something. My encouragement to you, my, my desire for you, my prayer for you, is that this day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ would be more than just another day on the calendar, would be more than just some holiday, but it would be the day that you understood that your hope, everything about you, you put in trusting in the person of Jesus Christ, who is our living hope. Is Jesus your living hope this morning? Awesome. That's what I'm talking about, Michael. Good job. You know, it didn't Jesus say, do not keep the little children from coming to me, but have faith as a child? I think sometimes we try to complicate it a little too much. Jesus loves you, desires to have a relationship with you, but he will not force himself on you. You coming, repenting of your sins, turning from self and turning to Jesus is what makes these promises applicable in your life. A living hope, an inheritance, and a salvation. Don't leave here today without that assurance in your life. Is Jesus your living hope? I want to ask you if you would to stand and pray with me, please. Father God, I thank you that we are not just simply dependent upon ourselves for a Savior. God, I thank you that we have Jesus. God, I thank you that our salvation has been secured, God. I thank you for that. And Lord, I pray for any person here, God, this morning, who although salvation is secured, it hasn't been received. God, I pray that no one would leave here this morning without knowing for certain that they have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, as we celebrate this resurrection day, God, do not, I pray that we would not let it be clouded by things that really don't matter but it would be a day that we focus on who your son is, what he's done for us, and the decision that it requires on our part. Lord, we love you and we thank you. Blessed be the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, as we sing, if you sense there's a decision that you need to make, I, I pray that you would come. All of our pastors are up here at the front. I know you think, well, it's Easter Sunday. I'll wait till next time. No, it, what better Sunday to come than on the day that we celebrate the resurrection? Right? So come this morning. If God is working in your heart, if you have not received him as your Lord and Savior, do that today. Amen?
As we get ready to take our offering, let me encourage you to stay standing and let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you. God, as we get ready to partake in the giving, God, you gave the ultimate gift, your son, who was willing to go to a cross, but, but praise be to God that he did not stay there. God, that you rose three days later, God, conquering Satan's sin and death. And in you, for those who have put their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ, they have victory over those things. Father, we stand with you in your victory. Jesus, make much of this as we give for the expansion of your kingdom. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Some more we sing. You're my heart, my maker, my ransom, you're my savior, you're my refuge, you're my hiding place. You're my hope. You're my helper, my healer, you're my blessing, redeemer, you're my answer, you're my saving grace, you're my hope. And you're my hope in the shadows, my charade in the battle, and my anchor, my 
for all my days. He stood. And you stand by my side. Jesus stood in my place. Jesus, no other name. Only Jesus, no other name. He's worthy. You Church, just a couple of quick announcements. Uh, if you are both a member or a guest, in the back is some information with something that we're calling the GC2 Expo. Just gives you some information regarding how to get connected, how to serve different ministries that you might be able to get plugged into and involved here in the life of Corinth. So see that there in the back. We are two weeks also from our marriage conference. You have one week to sign up. So let me encourage you. You can sign up in the back at your left, my right. There's a table back there. Or you can sign up online. Would love to have you be part of that. It's going to be a, an amazing weekend and a blessing um, to the life and families here at Corinth. And also we have a couple of our family discipleship milestones that we'll call FDMs coming up here in the next few weeks. we got one next week and then a couple of following. Basically, we want to continue to partner with parents to help equip you to invest and disciple your kids. So if you're a parent of a fifth grader, we got one coming up next week. You can see me about how to sign up and be a part of that. Also in your bulletin, there's other information about the ones coming up. And then if you are a guest of ours, there should be a blue Connect card in a seat somewhere in front of you. If you don't mind, just fill that out. You can put that in the offering plate or hand it to a pastor. We'd love to say thank you for being our guest and tell you a little bit more about life here at Corinth and what Jesus is doing through this church. So church, as we go out, we go out to love God, love people, and make disciples. Happy Easter, church. You're dismissed. God bless.